Well, welcome everybody. I'm so excited. By far, this is the biggest turnout we've ever had for any of our trainings. I'm really, really pleased that you all took the time to come over because what you're going to learn is very groundbreaking. It's things that we've never heard before. This is a partnership. This um, lecture today is a partnership between the Little River Institute, who Erica handles, and she's the director of, and my office, which is the Office of Diversity. And we've selected some subjects this year that we think are really important to all of us as learners, as teachers, as students. And so we're going to be bringing some workshops to you, seminars, whatever you want to call it, lectures that are a little different than anything you've had before. And today is not, it will be no exception. I want to introduce you to Dr. Ann Douglas. She's the Director of Behavioral Health and Prevention Programs at All Nations Health Center in Missoula. As an enrolled member of the Blackfeet Tribe, Dr. Douglas has dedicated her career to advocating and supporting Native youth and their families and community. She received her PhD in psychology from the University of Montana and completed an APA, I think it's American Psychological Association, <laughs> accredited internship and postdoc at Montana State University Psychology, Psychological and Counseling Services. Um, Dr. Douglas is a fierce advocate for Native youth. She's worked with and supported individuals, families, and communities to work through and heal from trauma. In her free time, Dr. Douglas enjoys spending time laughing and talking with her family and friends, reading and experiencing new cultures. I want to present to you, Dr. Douglas. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you for taking a piece of paper or tape. If you haven't gotten one, will you just let me know? You'll need one for the end. I think you. Okay, we'll give you guys some tape. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for the nice inter introduction and thank you for having me. Um, this can be a pretty heavy topic. Um, I'll come minimize that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So a little bit more about me. I was born and raised in Browning, Montana. Um, like Dr. Campbell said, I am an enrolled black sheep. Um, yeah. So I've been really passionate about working with Native people, Native families, um, why I went into psychology, I really wanted to work with youth. Um, and I've been really, um, it's been really amazing to have the job I have and to work with college level, um, elementary level, even the little tiny guys. So um, one thing I did find is that this, when working with native people, the idea of boarding schools, the trauma that's come from boarding schools kind of seeps into all the work that I've done with families and children. All right, so here's the agenda. So it's going to be a really quick overview of boarding schools. My background's not in the history of boarding schools, so I'll give you a little, a brief history. There's definitely more programs um, that you can look into if you want to know, like, the history of boarding schools, but we'll go through that a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about trauma, um, and then we'll look at the ongoing impacts and how boarding school era in the beginning has really impacted Native communities and Native families now, and then um, talk about healing. All right, so um, I want you guys to take care of yourself during this time, so this can be a pretty heavy topic. Um, so if you needed to get up and leave, um, if you need to just take a few minutes, please feel free. Um, jump up, take care of yourself before anything else. Um, for students, um, Amber Springs is, works here at the Student Health Services, and she's available, and she's right here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, and then for any employees, there's an employee assistance program, and you can learn more about that through your HR department. Um, and then if you're a community member, um, I drove around Haver, I got the big tour, and um, there is what looks like an urban Indian health center here called Bullhook. So I would encourage you to reach out to therapists there if you need further support. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna do a little activity. Sorry, let me get my notes. So in this presentation, I'd really like 
I don't like to lecture. It's not, I feel like it's not my job to lecture. I feel like we all have great knowledge that we can share. And I'm gonna share a little bit of my knowledge and background and education with you. Um, so throughout this presentation, I'll just weave in little things that we can do to kind of um, work towards healing. So this is one of them. And so what I would like us to do is to start off with this exercise. Um, in order to really understand the impacts of boarding schools, we have to get out of our heads. And I know this is an academic institution and we're, you know, we're here to learn and to, to make our brains huge. But really for this topic, we need to, to get out of our heads and a little bit more into our hearts and our feelings. So, um, so the definition <clears throat> of holding space is to be present with someone without judgment. It means that you're donating your ears and your heart without wanting anything else in return. It involves practicing empathy and compassion. So right now we're going to do a quick little mindfulness, mindfulness activity to just kind of help us get out of our heads a little bit and kind of move into that space of really feeling and thinking from our hearts. So if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. If you don't, that's fine too. But I want you guys to think of your favorite person in the whole entire world. So this person, whenever you think of them, see them, they automatically bring a huge smile to your face. This person can be a child, a friend, family, can even be yourself. Someone who means the world to you. Now that you have that person in your mind, let's hold them there. Study their face, breathe in their scent, hear their voice or other sounds that remind you of them. Take a moment to hold space for this person. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes, take a deep breath, keep that person in your mind. Now, as we continue, I, I encourage you to keep this person in your mind. How would you respond if this was their story? Sure. <laughs> I know it. They couldn't stop it from happening. So they would take them from further away and make it harder for their children to leave and go home. It was my first haircut. I cried when I saw my hair on the floor. Tears still well up in my eyes when I remember the way it laid on the floor. Without my natural language, I was broken and unable to celebrate my heritage, to express myself. Taking my identity <laughs> made me very powerless. I managed to learn uh, how to accept all the uh, I'm sorry, the loneliness that came because 
because I was gonna talk to my mother or my father. And we were not comforted by the boarding school matron or teachers. The pain and the loneliness and the, and the anger will always be with me. We are dealing with the erasure of our people. The, the government has been working on destroying tribal societies and institutions for 500 years. Um, I, I work with youth on the Heinrich Indian Reservation quite often, and so many of them tell me that they walk around with like a heavy load on their shoulders. They feel heavy all the time. <clears throat> And I truly believe that what that is, is they're, they're carrying the traumas of their ancestors and they're carrying the traumas of their, their parents and their grandparents. Um, and then they have to carry their own traumas. It's like our, our great beautiful blanket kind of got all chopped into pieces during that boarding school time or that time when we were trying to assimilate. And we have a lot of the pieces left and now we're trying to put them all back together and we're we're putting them all back together but it's probably never going to look exactly like our blanket was before so but it will still keep us warm it'll still help us it will still sustain us and it hurts to know that I can't give them the things that my parents could have given me if not for boarding school. Only by bringing it into the light can we begin to heal from it. So that's the first step that we're moving for. If our tribal cultures are going to stay alive other than existing as pockets of poverty, and sadness, uh, we have to heal. Um, telling the story and then help finding resources to turn things around. Um, that's what I think the coalition wants to do. The uh, eventual outcomes we would hope uh, would come out of the boarding school healing project would be uh, uh, healing programs that are put together by our own Indian people in our own Indian communities. We're changing the paradigm of education each day. Uh, we're saving the language one child at a time. How do you preserve the language? Improve the speaker. This healing is not just happening on the native side. It's not just for us that needs to heal over this history. It's also um, the non-native community that's really struggling with this healing. It's much more important that we share with our children that we're telling stories. It's not a very easy thing to, to do, but be strong. People my age need to be strong and just think about where we've been and teach it to our children. There was a couple of chats that popped up. Uh, oh, okay. Video is lagging. Okay. Yes. Um, oh. So Kirka. Yeah, answered. She got it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, though. Yeah. Awesome. So really, I like discussion based. What came up for you guys after watching that? Heartbreak. Heartbreak? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The incredible loneliness. Yeah. That's, that's very real. Mm -hmm. And it is, and it is multi generational trauma. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anger. Anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question of why. Why? Just why, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. All those things are very valid and it's kind of heart wrenching. And even though I've seen this video hundreds of times, I still get teary listening to those stories. Like, wow. Ouch. Especially thinking, you know, that I am native and that I do know people who've gone to boarding school. So that can be really heartbreaking to hear that they've had to endure such pain, but then, and now it's being passed down. Um, so we do have some definitions of trauma up here. Um, so if we look at PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, um, that is individualistic. That's the person, that's a diagnosis you get. It's in the DSM-5. And that's for the person who's witnessed or experienced a traumatic or traumatic events or event. Um, and that's the individual. So if we think of survivors of boarding schools, they've experienced lots of trauma. They've witnessed lots of trauma. Um, so I'm, I can't go back and diagnose in the past, but we could probably assume that there's lots of PTSD among survivors. And then like, I really like this video um, because the lady who works in um, Standing Rock, in our Pine Hill, Pine, Pine Ridge, um, she like hit the nail right on the head. She got it like with the intergenerational trauma it's that feeling like, you know, something it's, it's a heavy feeling that our kids have to carry. They weren't in boarding schools, uh, kids of survivors of residential schools. They weren't there, but they hold that trauma. They carry it. And how confusing to have to feel that and not know where it's coming from. But it's really this trauma that's being passed. So you weren't there to witness it. You can't, it never happened to you directly but you're feeling the impacts of it. And then moving on to um, historical trauma, which is kind of the whole umbrella. Like this, they said historical is still kind of happening, but it, three things need to happen. So the event was widespread among specific groups or populations um, with many group members being affected, which boarding schools, which happened at boarding schools. The event generated high levels of collective distress in the victimized group. And the event was perpetrated by outgoing members with the purposeful and often destructful intent, which that also was true. So boarding schools were really the idea in the beginning of Richard Henry Pratt, and it was an experiment. He, I don't know if anybody knows his famous slogan, kill the Indian and save the man. So what does that really say? What did he think of Native people, that they weren't human, that they were subhuman? How can you kill the Indian and still have a man left if this person is Indian? So really, he proposed this experiment to show the government, like, hey, I can take these people and kill this inherent Indianness in them and make them like us. And if you Google boarding schools and go to images and all the images that pop up, there's tons of images where you see a native person in their traditional regalia. And then right next to them is a picture of them after they left the boarding school. That was all for the purpose. So he could show that his experiment was working. So native people were being experimented on with boarding schools. Um, and we think of boarding schools, I think, just from being a clinician and working with trauma, um, really my whole career so far, and then being Native and having to live in the trauma. Um, I hear a lot of like boarding schools made Native people lose their identity. Like boarding schools, we lost our identity. And I, you know, I listened and I just don't believe that because Native people are so resilient. So what I like to say is that there is a disruption of identity. Because if we lost our identity completely, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the college down the road um, in their traditional language. We wouldn't have people learning their language, their culture. It would be gone. So our, our identity was disrupted. But one thing his experiment couldn't do was erase what's inherently in us. And that is who we are. So if it's being a Blackfeet person or a Grove Bump person or a Chippewa Cree, that's who you are as a person. That should not be erased. 
So there was a disruption in identity, but Native people are so resilient and we're working really hard to bring that back. And so we have to give credit to the residential school survivors who, you know, sat in the dark and would speak their language back and forth so nobody could hear. The ones who only remembered their name and their black and their black and their tribal language. You know, if that's the one thing they could take home, they took it home. So they were there was a lot of destruction, but not once did his experiment ever make us lose our identity. So he did a lot of destruction. And then subsequent boarding schools did a lot of destruction, but it didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was erase. Um, it did plant, though, an insidious seed of shame. So now we have to work with our communities and our people to heal that shame. Because in boarding schools, you were abused. They were abused. They were neglected, sexually abused, physically abused watching their friends and their family get murdered and nothing being done about it. So you were taught that it was shameful to be who you are. And I come from a, um, so my psychological background, I'm more Rogerian, person-centered. So your true authentic self, somebody telling you that who you are inside, that one thing you can't change is bad and wrong and we're not going to deal with it. Like that is the seed of um, unhealthy coping mechanisms and mental health issues. So they planted that seed um, in a lot of our native people. And with um, intergenerational trauma, that's being passed down. So although we have very resilient people, we have people doing great things that they like still that, am I, is it okay to be me? Is it okay to be native? Um, might still exist and why we're seeing a lot of um, disruption in our communities. Mm -hmm. All right, so ongoing impacts. There are lots of ongoing impacts. So there's tears in our community. So there's um, mental health issues, substance use issues, um, Increased incarceration, um, it's created self-doubt. So there's lots of things that are going on that we see that were directly impacted by residential schools. So um, there's been a lot of research on Holocaust survivors and their offspring, their children and grandchildren. There's been some research with native people um, and survivors of residential schools. And what they found with both populations is that um, children and grandchildren have increased thoughts of suicide, depression, PTSD, anxiety, substance use, learning difficulties, problems in school, all impact um, the children of these survivors. And one thing that I know quite a bit about and what I work in my everyday job is working with people um, to prevent suicide, intervention of suicide, and then postvention. Um, and this is this is huge. This is huge here in Montana. So in um, 2019, the stats up here are nationwide, but here in Montana in 2019, 69% um, of the suicide were um, Native men specifically between the ages of 18 to 24. So our native men, what's going on with, you know, our native men, we're losing them and they're young. And um, in 2019, um, the occupation listed on people who died by suicide was student. So they were high school students, um, college students. They were maybe your peers. So they were, they were young. And the means, the number one means in two, 2019 was hanging. So if you think like how horrible a death it would be to die by hanging. And then, so the numbers came out in 2000, for 2020, right during the pandemic. I went to um, a national conference via Zoom. So I was in comfort of my own home, but 
they were talking about how the numbers for the majority population have actually gone down a little bit, but the, the numbers for BIPOC have gone up. And again, in Montana, this, the stats for Montana, 73% of our native men, of all the reported suicides in Montana, 73% were our native men. Again, between the ages of now 14 to 29. And occupation. So I think this kind of speaks to people seeing that, hey, our students are suffering, we need to put stuff in place. So student is no longer the number one occupation. The occupation for 2020 was um, general laborers. So again, my job is to figure out how do we get the right information to these people. Um, and then the way they've the way they've decided to end their lives, 51% um, died by firearms. And just below that, again, we had um, around 48% by hanging. So really violent, violent deaths. All right, another big, um, Impact, continuing impact is the misunderstanding of culture, culture. It also creates further trauma. So we have the continue, the continuation of removal of our native children from our native homes. So I read an article um, actually a few days ago, and it said that um, a lot of, in the beginning, so like, I guess in the 1980s, children, native children were being removed because the households were too full. There were too many people in one household. But if we take a look at our native people, we're collectivistic. We love extended family. We have our grandmas and our aunts and our cousins all living under one roof. But because the worldview is different and we don't have a mom and dad and 2.5 children in a white picket fence, that looks like, oh, that's something that we need to save these kids from. Does that, does that sound familiar? That we need to save our native kids from something that doesn't look familiar to us? Yeah, it sounds really similar to boarding schools. We need to take them from their culture and make them adapt to our culture. And a native population in Montana is around 6.5. We actually have native people are the highest minority population in Montana. But Native children account for 30% of the kids in foster care. So there are a lot of kids still happening. So we might not have them being stripped out to go to boarding schools, but they're still being taken away in large numbers. And a lot of it can be pushed back to misunderstanding of culture and how we decide we want to raise our kids. It also can be led back to abuse. So if we go back and think of... Um, Native boarding schools, Native people had amazing ways of raising their children. Um, and then they were taken out of their loving environments and put in a school. And like one survivor mentioned on here, she never was comforted. She felt alone and isolated. They were abused. So you're in this school for so many years, you're abused, you're neglected you're shamed, you feel inferior. And then if you're lucky enough to come out alive, you're put back on the reservation or you're put back into the community and you're expected to raise a family. How are you gonna raise your family? Are you gonna know your traditional ways? Are you gonna know how to comfort a child if you were never comforted? Because we're, we're not talking about like, you know, kids going off to college, we're talking about little guys, four or five years old. I have a four-year-old and I couldn't imagine like him being taken from me. So they learned how to parent in boarding schools. So of course, when they come out and have their own families, it makes sense that they don't know. They have to, people have to deal with their own traumas they don't have the coping skills to deal with their own traumas. They weren't given that. And then on top of that, now they have to raise kids and they don't, they only know what they were taught in a boarding school. 
So then we have that abuse. Um, yes. Oh, and then that which leads to stereotypes. And that still impacts. So impacts just, it comes around um, 360, like the boarding schools impact how we function as a society and how we're raising our families. And this really came to my, so I taught parenting classes for 10 years before I got my PhD. And this was really, um, just really hit me hard. Like, holy cow. I felt like I'm an imposter a little bit because I was coming in. And I don't know if anybody knows the curriculum of um, Circle of Security. Um, it's attachment-based kind of curriculum. I, I really enjoy it. I love that it has like a secure foundation. The kid comes back to you. Um, but talking with elders, talking with people that I respect, I was like, hey, this sounds like really like something Native people have done for years and then I'm coming in because you were you know you have to do this because CPS was called on you and I'm teaching you what you probably inherently would have learned from your own people your own families but that was taken from you and so it just really hit me hard and kind of why I went into this kind of area of like yeah we need to heal this trauma we need to work on healing um, what has happened Okay, so here's a quote um, about healing. I'll just let everybody read it on their own. <coughs> and if you don't know who Dr. Oh, can everybody see it? Um, yeah, we can. You can. Okay, I can. She's gonna read it. I'll read it. Okay. So it says, in our view, community healing, along with individual and family healing, are necessary to thoroughly address historical unresolved grief and its present manifestation. The process is not quick, nor is it easy. However, without such a commitment to healing the past, we will not be able to address the resultant trauma and prevent the continuation of the atrocities in the present. And Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart is, um, I think she's a Lakota and she works at the University of New Mexico and she really did a lot of work with historical and trauma and kind of brought that term um, into life. So, so ways to heal, we're gonna look at the individual, families, tribal communities, and then the majority population. So healing, healing the individual. I think this is really important. We have to go back to culture. I think native people inherently know what they need. Again, going back to my foundation of person-centered, we know what we need to heal. We just need support to get there. Um, so really giving the reins to the native culture of how do I heal? Who do, who do I talk to? Where do I go? Um, we need to work through feelings of shame and unworthiness. We need to address that. We need to talk about it. Um, we need to give ourselves compassion and empathy for our experiences we had no control over and then learn new ways. So one of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So not holding on to, we don't want to replace our shame with like guilt, like, well, I should have done better, but I did what I could. I survived, but now I know better. So now I'm going to do better. Um, and then having self-compassion, being loving with ourselves. I was talking with a really good colleague of mine um, who's Blackfeet, and she was saying that our words are our prayers. So when we talk, we need to talk positive. We need to send good messages out into the universe. So that means even about ourselves. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I'm such a you know bad person. I'm this, I'm that. But kind of switching the way we think and talk about ourselves in our community. That, you know, I, I might have made a mistake, but that doesn't make me a bad person. I might have gone through this, but that's not my fault. 
It's not mine to hold. It is mine to heal and kind of working through that. Um, and when we were talking about it, I kind of thought of, oh, that sounds really familiar to like cognitive therapy. So the way we talk about ourselves, the way we kind of change our thinking to kind of change our perspective so that I'm not bad. What happened to me was bad. So kind of putting that out into the world. Um, one of my professors, every time my phone would ring, he'd make us bring a snack the next time. Um, so community healing. Um, oh, and I wanted to actually about individual healing really quickly. Um, if you know, if you ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's kind of like a, a pyramid and at the very top self-actualization. Um, I really encourage you guys to look into um, Narciss Blood and Ryan Heavy, Heavy Head. They did um, a really great presentation on the, contribu the contribution of the Sitsa Cub Blackfoot people into that hierarchy. And when he was up there, um, early 1900s found that like the Blackfeet people, 80% of that population had reached self-actualization. Um, and so really it's a different way of looking at psychology. And so we are a collectivist society, but if we don't bring our full, authentic, true, healthy selves to the community, we're um, not doing anybody else good. So we really do need to do the work internally to be able to help the community. Um, it's a really great lecture. So community healing, again, culture. We need to go back to culture. Um, incorporating ceremonies, really asking Native people, how, you, how can you heal? And really listening to that, not having that, this is what you should do. Even as Native people, I would never go into a community and say, this is what you have to do, even my own community. But what could I do to support our efforts to heal together as a community? Um, storytelling. I think that's a huge piece. And it was said in the video, let's talk about it. Let's build an environment, a healthy environment where it's okay to share. It's okay to share our experiences and not be shamed for them. We're not going to talk bad about each other, but we're going to give ourselves space to be um, recognized and be our authentic selves. Um, and I threw narrative therapy in there because that's one way you can do it. Um, and then combating lateral violence, lateral oppression. So lateral violence is displaced violence or oppression directed against one's peers rather than the oppressors. This can be shown as shame, belittling, humiliating, damaging, sometimes violent behavior. This could be seen as teasing. And I know in a lot of tribal cultures, there's teasing as good, but we have to look at teasing as is it hurtful or are we doing it to educate? And so there's a fine line. Like once it goes to the place where we're kind of inherently feeling a shame, then no longer is it helpful to our community. Um, and this can be, I think this is a big part of healing communities of having kind of helping us move away from that crab in the bucket mentality, which again, kind of goes back to reservations and having to go to the Indian agent to get rations and you weren't able, you were very, tribal people were very self-sufficient and reliant. And then all of a sudden they weren't able to hunt. They weren't able to live the way that they wanted to. They had to rely on somebody. And so again, that, um, that kind of is ingrained like, okay, now like I need, I need this. So if, if this person has this, that means I can't have it. We need to work through that and make sure that we're um, working together as Native people. And this can be an example I was thinking was telling other tribal members that they aren't Indian enough. And this is a big debate. I mean, I've heard a lot growing up. I did grow up in Browning, but we need to stop fighting within each other and start working with each other if we want to heal our communities. We want to welcome our children. We want it to be a welcoming environment for everybody. Um, yes. So that's community healing. The majority population, be an ally. Help. 
not help, support Native people. Hold space for experiences. When Native people share, when we talk about what happened, it's not an attack. It's sharing our experience. This is what happened. And that's one thing I, I say in even therapy sessions, that nobody can tell you how to feel. Nobody can tell you that. That's yours. And so really holding space, like we did for the person in our mind, hold that space for others. It might hurt. It might be really hard to sit with. And that's good. That's good. If, you, if you're sitting with somebody and you can feel what they're feeling, you have empathy. You have compassion. And that is really hard to do because we don't want to go to a place like that all the time. We don't want to sit in those uncomfortable feelings. But in order to heal and to process and to work through, we have to. We have to get to that point. Um, and then educate yourself about the tribal populations in your area. Learn more. Be active. Don't, like, be a part of the communities. You, here in Haver, you have two reservations really close by. Participate in their activities. Go be a part of their community. One thing I've always like really loved about Native people is they're so, we, I guess, they, we are so welcoming and loving. You, like somebody comes in and we're like, oh, come in, eat, sit down, whatever, you know. So really reach out, learn more. Um, learn about the experiences of people. And, you know, get out of your, your little box and really go and speak that information. Because how amazing is it to when somebody wants to hear you? I don't know if you've ever had the experience of sitting down with somebody and just having them just really listen to you. Like, that's such an amazing feeling. And so if you can be that for somebody, if you can listen to your Native peers, your Native students, your friends, just kind of sit with them. I think that's really healing in itself. And then believe. Believe survivors, believe families, believe the communities. All right. So next is our activity. Does everybody have their piece of paper? You either got a piece of paper, or you got tape. Okay. So why did I have you guys do that? No paper, no tape? Oh, neither. Oh, yes. no. Who needs I am totally unprepared. Oh, wait. Sure, actually, I want you to tear your own. Oh, yeah. tear my own? Oh, they're not going to have to write. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, as big as you want, little as you want. Okay. All right. So, this is my interactive part of it. And definitely, if you have questions. So I purposely put the white piece out so you wouldn't know. So this is community. This represents community. Our little community in this room. This represents us. It was a picture. Do we? Did you know that it was a picture? Hopefully not. But what I had you do with each of you in this room was part of this community. And you were torn away. So the tear symbolizes you, you, what happened, your traumas, your experiences, your unique individualness. So our community is now not put together. Look at our community. Mm -hmm. Does it look like this? No. So how do we get our community back together? Healing. Healing, and there was what? Oh. Finding the pieces. Finding the pieces. Where who who has the pieces? Everybody. You're the pieces. So you, the community members, the, the tribal people, the allies, they're the pieces in our community. So how do how do we put it back together? We have we need a pieces. So we identified we all we're all a piece, right? Okay, so first acknowledgement. We need to acknowledge that our community has tears in it and that we need to work to, to build it back together. Awesome. Now what? Talk. Talk. Communicate. Awesome. What are we talking about? What's that? 
what we all went through. Yes, we're sharing our experiences. We're visiting, we're, we're talking does, and acknowledging. What does yours look like? Right. Yeah. That's, what's the shape of your piece? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. What is the shape of your piece? What do you bring to the table? Okay. Now what? Does our, does our community look like it's put together? We did. We did. We acknowledged it and we talked about it. We didn't heal. We didn't heal. How do we heal? We go see N. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No. <laughs> How do we heal? Therapy. Together. Therapy. Together. together. Therapy. Therapy. If you people with tape, what's what does it say on your tape? Therapy. Therapy. Oh. Ceremony. Ceremony. Oh. Language. <laughs> Language. Allies. Allies. Understanding. Understanding. So what I want you guys to do right now is heal our community. I know it's really hard to come back together after, but I would like to explain a little bit about what we did. And you guys can still continue. So really what this activity was supposed to kind of show us is that we were a community. Things happen. Like that's why I had you share your own pieces of paper. Doesn't matter because we have we're all unique. We all have our own life experience that we bring to the table to make up a community. So you were tore your own piece that's unique to you. And together we're gonna come back. We're all scattered pieces. We acknowledge that. We talked about um, our stories, we talked about who we are, and then we work together. I mean, it was really great to see how people did it. So we had some come straight to the board. We had some talking together to see, you know, what piece do you have? So working and collaborating together and to have our, um, um, our picture up. So does our, does our community look like our community did before? our experiences. It is a little different. It's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. Will it ever look like this? If I gave you all day to finish this, would it look like this? No. No. So the expectation shouldn't be that when we heal, our healing, we're never going to look like this again. And that's okay. That's part of the acknowledgement. What matters is that piece that we work together. We did the work, we acknowledged it. We looked for tools. So everybody had a piece of paper. You had to search for somebody with a piece of tape. And everybody had, was that therapy? There was a therapy tape out there, understanding, ceremony. So then you go and those are your pieces of healing and then you come together. So we can have all the pieces. We can know what to do, but if we don't tape them, put them together, then then we can't heal. And in order to do that, we all needed to be at the table and we all needed to work together. And I think our picture looks pretty darn good. Yeah. So good job. Thanks for coming. I have one last thing to do. Um, just wanted to give you a gift from oh. us at MSU Northern for coming and Thank sharing. You. And we really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh.